All right, now we're here with Larry Moore and Hackformers. So again, for those just awesome. checking out, Hackformers Live or a Periscope. Uh, Hackformers is about teach security, teach Christ, and teach security in Christ. Uh, teach security, uh, dealing with local security expertise. We've had people te teach and secure APIs from Microsoft, that'd be Michael Howard. For an example, teach Christ includes the gospel. Jesus, fully God, fully man, died for our sins, was buried and rose from the grave, and also teach security in Christ, drawing parallels. So without further ado, I want to invite Larry Moore to speak. Well, thank you, everyone. And I'd like to extend a welcome out to Periscope, as well as to those of you who are sitting here today. Um, for those of you on Periscope not familiar, I'm Larry Moore. I've been practicing in the information security space for nearly 20 years. I was a... Uh, software developer before that from anything from applications, device drivers, kernels, uh, you name it, I've, I've probably written something for it. Um, the purpose of my presentation today is about good account management. Now like everybody in the room, I love new technology. I am, you can say a hacker by trade, if you've ever watched the TV show Home Improvement, you can call me Tim the Toolman Taylor because I like to fix things, I break things occasionally. Um, I like trying out new things. But one thing that's important, and, and we, can't, we can't miss this, we gotta remember this, is although it's a fantastic idea to learn new technology, even if it's new hacks, you may not like what had happened, but you gotta admit the attack was rather interesting. You might be interested in that concept. But we also have to remember to keep our feet focused back on what I call old school, on, on the basics. Because it's, it, it's, you may be looking out for the brand new attack and you may think, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to prevent that from happening, while at the same time missing out that uh, the attackers just, for example, got into, your, got into your system, added an account, and are now accessing it. So in other words, they're bypassing your excellent uh, your excellent security system looking into the new attack by focusing on something old. So I wanted to, I wanted to uh, present something like this because I think it's important that we remind ourselves on what... Time out for a second. Um, does anybody have any special dietary needs? We have wine, pizza, and then and spinach, or like uh, vegetarian for those who don't have meat. So I do everybody can have an interest. Do you pass them around? Just pass them around. Okay. So, what you see on the screen are plates. The reason I put this one here is because account management is very important. Now, what I'm not going to do in this talk is just repeat a lot of the things that you already know. I'm not going to say a lot of the same things, um, like for example, what NIST says about account management or what uh, what you have to do for COVID or PCI. We already know all that. What I'm going to cover this time are my personal experiences in auditing and other other ways of managing accounts. My experiences, my mistakes, with the intention that hopefully you learn something and you can apply it to your company. I don't want to say things that we already know. I want to try to focus on something new. So what is auditing? We all know what auditing is, but um, I put these, these, these bullet points here because the first three we already know what is important in auditing. Okay. We know what's important in our um, information risk management program uh, for knowledge, communication, and separation of duties. That's pretty straightforward. What a lot of people ask is when I put down reasonable empowerment, what does that mean? Well, we know that complexity is the enemy of security. And complexity, too much complexity, can also impact your auditing program. It can also impact how how effective your security management is. Like for example, we all know that if you add a new account for just a general employee who comes into your company, usually it might take three people to uh, approve the account. It might take the person's manager, it might take HR, and it might take somebody who's uh, who owns the account that that person is going to be accessing. That's pretty straightforward. But imagine if you needed six approvals, eight approvals, 15 approvals. You needed to get legal, you need to get financial, you need to get everything, everything all the way down to the kitchen sink in the space. Now you're adding all this extra complexity. As an auditor, I not only have to worry about who, who is invalidly trying to access the account, but I also need to know, is there any way that can be improved for cost savings, uh, to improve business, to improve transactions, anything like that, because too much overhead People have a way of getting in. People have a way of getting around the cracks. So 
I put down reasonable empowerment to minimize unreasonable bureaucracy. If you've ever worked in the federal or state government, you probably know what I'm talking about. Okay, and it, we often think companies have uh, they've minimized everything because it's protecting their bottom line. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes that's not. So what I'm going to start off with is what type of accounts are we talking about? Now the list you see on the screen, you may have different terms for it. Your company may call it, uh, have different terminologies for it. But these are the general types of screen, the types of accounts that you see. Domain, for example, we all know is for Windows accounts. Emergency accounts are for anybody who needs to access a system during an emergency, like for example, on your uh, your coup process, your DR process, because we often forget. As a gatekeeper, it's not only important to keeping the bad guys out. There may be times you have to open the doors to let people in for an emergency. For example, if I'm talking about an emergency recovery, and if I go to the person and say, "Well, wait a minute, you need to you, you need to give it, it takes two days for a new account. You got to do blah blah blah," and you're talking about an emergency restoration process, you're going to be out the door. You're going to be looking for another job. So it. Um, now, what I have as um, that are bold here, I'm, I'm focusing on these three because these are generally the more vulnerable of all the accounts. In other words, service or application, you can, can, can you can combine it. Some companies do. Some companies treat them differently. But I'm going to treat them all as a system account, and then you have a privileged user account. So starting off with user accounts. Larry, one, one thing real quick on the emergency, one of the yeah. examples where that really is used is on the, within the medical field where you go in for emergency room and the doctor is not your doctor. Your doctor's authorized access to your medical record. In an emergency, any doctor can get access to your medical record, mm -hmm. but you put enhanced monitoring, etc. They call it break glass access. Yeah, perfect it's example. When I was in the hospital, the nurses who needed access to my medical records, it, it was all by a card system that, that had their picture on it. My sister, for example, is an intern. She works for the VA. Now, she has worked in emergency rooms before. If my spleen is hanging out and I'm in the emergency room, I don't want my sister having to keep forgetting her password. Or, oh, man, what was the password? I want her doing her job and saving my life. And if she has to access to my medical records, I want that instant. Okay, seconds do count. But if somebody tries to break in and tries to fake their way as my sister, trying to pretend they're an internist, I don't want them getting in. So yes, you do, it, it's an excellent example. Could you stand in front of your slide? Oh, I'm sorry. the lighting. Okay. That people can see your face. Oh, he's blinded, but we're Yeah, I'm blinded. <laughs> <laughs> but problem. do they want to see my face? I want yeah. to see my face. blind, but now I see. Yeah. <laughs> or is it the lie. other way around? Yeah. <laughs> okay, now, so what are we talking about a user account? Now, it seems pretty straightforward. Somebody comes onto the company, somebody joins the company, um, they get an account. Now, is, is it impact? I can take my glasses. That's great. Okay. If, it, um, if you're joining the company, you get an account, and you leave the company, you, you, your account is deleted. Sounds easy. However, it's, that's not always the case. Um, you have contractors. Sometimes contractors are done early on their project. You obviously have to have people who were terminated for, invalid, for something that invalid that they did. But there's also the path of permanent employees who are on temporary assignments. Let me give you an excellent example. Um, I'm that old. I worked on OS2 2.0 for those of you who remember. Uh, I worked for IBM at the time. When, I, when we worked on OS2 and 2.0 was released, IBM was um, deluged with numerous new users who wanted to find out about how to install OS2, how to make it configured for their system, etc. So IBM said all new developers for each development team must temporarily go over and help the help desk help them with the new customers. I was the new guy on the block, so I had to go to the help desk for three months. That required a temporary account on the help desk. I was a permanent employee, but I was doing a temporary assignment. So I helped, I was on the help desk for about three months, the, the curve went down to a sort of normal, and then I was able to get back into my normal development routine. So in that case, I needed access to the help desk resources. And then when I was done, my account was removed for that because I was no longer needing access. But it doesn't always happen in companies. A lot of times, 
uh, companies may ask somebody, oh, you used to do um, uh, databases. We need you to help create a new database. We need you for about two months, set up the new database, just get it running, and then we can have somebody else manage it. It happens all the time where permanent employees often are on temporary assignment. They get, their, they get the account they need to do their job, and they're done, but their temporary access still exists. That happens a lot. Contractors are often, they may be on a six month assignment, they completed in four months. Thank you very much, we appreciate the work you did. Have a great day. But their accounts are still active because the, it's not properly managed, okay? Often what happens is that auditors go to the system and administrators for information regarding the employee. That's not the right way to go. Sysadmins manage the system, not the employee. If I'm a sysadmin and you ask me, what about Joe, is he still there? As far, as far as I know, he is. I don't know if Joe is done with his assignment. All I know is I'm managing the system, Joe has an account. Is Joe still, does Joe still need it? I don't know, you have to go to his manager. And many auditors mistakenly go to the sysadmin for, it, for information rather than going to the person's manager, okay? Another problem, excessive permissions. That's happened to me before. I had administrative permissions on accounts I should not have had administration, administrative permissions, and I'm sure all of you have maybe, I'm sure have all had that in one in some time in your career. It's often where people create excessive permissions. Well, do we, does he really need it? I don't know, let's just give it to him anyway. Okay, that's a big mistake. Shared accounts is another problem. You may need, Companies often create shared accounts, but there's no way to manage who is accessing the, the, uh, the system and for why. And it's often prohibited by many regulatory uh, requirements, okay? Uh, but that doesn't mean that companies don't do it. It may be prohibited, but so what? They do it anyway. Um, we all know Windows, you have guest accounts, anonymous accounts, anything that doesn't tie the employee to the account. And then finally, single sign-on. I love single sign-on. I've worked on single sign-on before. There's some great solutions. But often, oftentimes, single sign-on isn't properly implemented. So I may have, that, I'm, I should have been given, granted access to two systems. And because of an error, I have access to 12 through one account, okay? Another, now the second category I'm gonna focus on is system accounts. As I mentioned, it could be application, it could be anything like that. This is even worse. I mean, we talked about privileged accounts before or anything like that, but system accounts can be even be worse because I have yet to audit a system where system that any type of system account is not proper is sh should have been but not properly covered. In other words, system accounts or let me go back. Office, user accounts go through change management processes, but often not system accounts or non-user accounts. The place to handle that is actually in your build book for your systems. One of the things Oracle had a process where they you, you changed the, the root password, if you will, or the Oracle password, Oracle user, and that was one root level password. There were four or five others that were behind the scenes. They Their latest versions give you the option to change those to different things, but that's a case where the manufacturer actually had to make some changes in order to avoid hidden system accounts with default passwords yep. running around loose. Now to add on to Vern's comment, um, from the auditing perspective, I every single time I've had an audit, there's always some sort of account that I, I come across, okay, what's this account for? I don't know. Well, what is it doing? I don't know. Who, why was it created? I don't know. And then you go to your customer and you get the same answer. Okay, sometimes people know, sometimes people don't. But the problem with system accounts is it now puts you on the spot, since you're required to delete unnecessary accounts, PCI requires it, HIPAA requires it, we'll go through the line, but you now have to decide, should I do, what should I do with that account? Just because it does, because it, nobody knows about it, doesn't mean it's not a valid account. It's all too often somebody creates an account, they say, I'm just, it's just a temporary fix until we get our new solution. That temporary fix turns into a permanent fix, okay? And two years no, later, <laughs> what, what's, what's this thing for? And I've had this, I, I had this happen all the time. The problem, that I, the added problem is, 
you have a customer who might be under SOX requirements. They call you and they say, what's this account for? All right, let me find out. I, and then you look and you look and you look and you're talking, you're talking, and you two two months later you still don't know what the account is. Nobody knows. It's there. What do you do with it? But now you have an angry customer who's trying to find out. The regulators are beating down on their necks. And you don't know. So that means they don't know. You don't have to go back to the regulators. They do. Now we're talking business. We're talking about the impact of your business. Remember, when customers come in and they may talk to you, they may sit down with you. Oh, what is your security? Oh, my security is great. Blah, 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 blah. It's, we do this and this and this and this and this. Okay, but now the, the rubber's hitting the road and they're finding out the hard way that it's not as good as your marketing team says. Okay? No <laughs> offense to say. I was about to say, hey, you're like, no you're offense to say, okay. Yeah. But that's the problem is, as an auditor, I have to know. That's why I put knowledge in in the, in the first slide, because you have to know what's going on. And people change jobs. So you can look at it, you can look at your monitoring, you can look at your logs, and it may give you some clues, but it may not be enough. It may not satisfy your customer requirements. So now you have the dilemma. Do you delete a valid account? Or do you suspend what may be a potentially malicious account? Suspend. Yeah, exactly. Especially when it looks like a system account because it now, may break something going yeah, on in the background. Exactly. You know, Bernie, I'll sit down. Okay. <laughs> you know more than I do. No, yeah, yeah. Um, no just kidding. But, um, but Vern's actually right. Um, what we have to do is suspend an account knowing full well that the attacker can come in and re enable the account. Deleting an account is better because now they have to recreate it. But, but Vern hit it on the head. Vern, it by, if I suspend an account and it's a valid account and the customer complains, it's much easier for me to re-enable it and have it go on. Okay. The problem is, what do you do? You don't know. Um, so when I do, when I review it and I don't know what's going on, if I don't, if there is a, an account I don't know about, I'll record it. I'll mark it as. I'll suspend it. How long do you suspend it? Well, there may be a quarterly report. It may be an account to generate a quarterly report. Well, then you don't want to delete it after a month. You may have to keep it suspended for six months and then see what happens. And if there's no impact, you may be able to delete it at a later time. Okay? But you want to keep a record because if you check it later and it, it's re-enabled, you now have a bigger problem. You now know there's something suspicious going on. Okay? An alert on it. Set alert on alert. Same thing. Yeah, it gets changed. Yeah. Okay. Um, so uh, I always I always like to do temporary suspensions. It should be based on your company policy. You may have to do it for a month. May be fine. Six months may have to be required. But you have to be careful about what you do. Uh, some people might be, oh, I deleted. Get, just get rid of it. And then you get an angry customer. And you may think about it. You may not re-enable it the same way it was before. Now it's not working. Uh, for the compliance aspect of it, you said uh, PCI, so would that be uh, just sufficient for them if you, hey, it's not deleted, but it's suspended? As long as you report it, as long as you mark it and, and document it as, as that case. Yes, PCI will tell you that you have to delete unused accounts, but you can say we suspended it because we're not sure what it is, I'm keeping track of it, I, I checked it a week ago and it was the same, nothing changed, we have alerts. Okay. Okay. Those are my mitigating controls, my compensating controls, and that is sufficient for PCI. Okay. The fact with the auditor, they you follow the concept of knowledge and communication, okay? Because you know what's going on, you're being communicated, if something goes wrong, that usually alone will satisfy PCI. It, even if they find it as a finding, they might say, okay, it's a finding, but in six months you, you delete it, I'll check with you six months later. Uh, so obviously you keep records to identify potential patterns because you can get an alert, but what if it's just somebody re-enabled it mistaken? Well, okay, that's that's a, a problem, but it's a quick fix. If he does it three, four, five times, you now have something a lot more serious. So you've got to be careful about that. Well, you've also got a neck to choke because you should know who enabled that. Exactly. Exactly. So there's an audit trail, and there's somebody you can get your hands around. Yeah. yeah. The other thing is the level of permissions, because it's the biggest problem. The big problem I've seen a lot of times is 
people go in and just, oh, just give them enterprise admin or give them right <laughs> yeah. and you're like, no. Again, as a, <laughs> Even as the a, developers. Well, they just that that permissions. Again, yeah. I'm exaggerating. Don't know what permissions because nobody's forced them to test the level. Yeah. Um, see, that's remove that, all the permissions and then start adding and see what you really need. Well, you don't have to be careful about this. that because you don't want somebody now to be locked out when they have something yeah. important. Well, You're right yeah. where you have to remove excessive permissions, and that has happened to me a yeah. lot too. Right. And also, as as an auditor, I may have to look at somebody's. Okay, Joe's manager is Alice. Alice, mm -hmm. does Joe have the right permission? Yes. Well, how do I know that? Or how does she know yeah, that? Let's... You have to be careful about those things, um, which is well, so... Especially with system, because yeah, developers yeah. notoriously, and One -on -one. having managed developers for a lot of years, and, they don't test properly. And as a former developer, I'll tell you, if you Sorry. ask me to, to, to imply change management to one line, to account yeah. that may be said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw a hissy thing. I mean, I'll mm -hmm. be honest. I mean, I... But it's important. Change management is yeah. critical. No matter how minor the change, mm -hmm. it, whether it's Vern's yeah. example of, of some sort of record, or but if you're creating a new account or you're changing the permissions of an existing account, you need to apply change management. And the reason is that I, as an auditor, or you as a, as a gatekeeper, if you will, you have to know who is there and why. Because if you see an account that you don't know, is it valid or is it invalid, and you have no way to find out. Now that's taking extra work, that's taking extra time out of your work to have to be able to, uh, uh, in, to uh, yes. Yes, kind of a systemic way to deal with that is role-based access control, where you establish roles. Mm -hmm. And um, the, they did that with the, the HL7 for the healthcare. Mm -hmm. uh, the VA went and did a fairly extensive project, right FI each role in the, the, and they had an addendum for VA because they were unique in some areas because yes. of the military aspect. A role-based yeah. access control works. And in your change management, um, you need to factor in an emergency change management uh, plan in place because if you have to do recovery, there, you, you don't want somebody coming up to you and saying, oh, wait a minute, you're not doing it right. You need to apply a change management process. You need to open a ticket. Well, wait a minute, I've got 15 minutes to implement my critical server. It's Black Friday, and we're not processing transactions. So you need to factor in emergency situations. You need to factor in extensive retention. You need to factor in backups. Every single one of you, I'll tell you something you may not have known about yourself, but everybody in this room has a JD and Murphy's Law. Why? Because it happened to me too. Who's, who's, the primary, who's the primary sysadmin? Well, that's Joe. Well, he's on vacation, all right? Who's his backup? I don't know. All right? It, the backup is Alice. Okay, I'll talk to Alice. No, she's in the hospital. All right, who's the third backup? I don't know. Um, when I go through my audits and I have to, I have to audit something and I can't find the sysadmins or the sysadmins are unavailable. Now that makes me look bad because now my, my customer may be angry or my manager may be angry. He said, okay, you were assigned this two weeks ago. I'm trying to find out who the person is who can tell me about it, but nobody knows. We go back to the knowledge concept. A lot of companies do not put in backups. They just have one person doing it. That's great until that one person is no longer available. I was in the hospital about back in October. You would not have been able to contact me. So if I was a sysadmin somewhere, who was my backup? And if you don't know that, you can't tell your customer. And if your customer is doing is under regulatory requirements for some sort of audit, they don't know either. So it's critical that you have backups, okay? As well as backups for your change management process. Because if it fails, you need to have it restored. Okay, going back into ch continuing on change management. I put this in because my personal experience in the software development field, going back to OS2. Um, if you were to look at my code way back in the early 90s, you'll see some things that you thought, man, that's strange. Why is he doing it? He's a poor programmer. No. The reason I had to do, like for example, I worked in the printer device driver team. I had to be able to print not only locally on the, on the same machine, but also through a server. Some customers were using earlier versions of OS2 through, through earlier um, uh, job features, like for example, portrait or landscape, while at the same time supporting newer printers that were coming out with new features. 
So some cases, I had to make three settings. Let's say you change from portrait to landscape. You would see three changes on my code. Why? Because I had to be backward compatible. It was absolutely adamant that if I was unable to print on my 2.0 driver to a 1.3 driver, if the 1.3 driver did not recognize the code, the, the, the change, the job change, I would lose my job. So when you, you might be reading scripts, even if you're an expert in Python or Perl or whatever the case may be, you might be looking and say, why is he doing it this way? That's why I always include, if I'm ever evaluating this, I always demand comments. This may not seem like a big deal, but two years from now, you may be asking, why is it this way? You need to know who's doing it, why, anything special. <coughs> Developers do not comment their code, and that's a shame. Because it's important. If you have return codes, you need to explain why. You need to upset any type of update model. Why did you have to update it? Because if I need to know why, was it updated in a, for a valid reason? Or did an attacker get in, change the script, and then uploaded it, and now it's doing something else? I don't know, and that's my job as an auditor. I have to know. Who's the owner? Is it used by a third party? Is it, is it for the third party, like as a quarterly report, you know, to generate quarterly reports? You need to make sure of that. And obviously, run with least privileges. Yes. When you start including comments in your code, does it leave you more vulnerable for attacks and you know, people understanding more of what's going on so they can tweak? Any, any good programmer is going to be able to figure that out anyway. Okay. You don't need comments. If, if you're a good pro I mean, um, I know, for example, Java code is very easy to disassemble. There's a, there's a tool that you'll uh, just disassemble your job. You are right in the pers I'm sorry, go ahead. You're right in the perspective that it makes it easier to identify. But any good programmer worth their soul is going to figure it out. Yeah. It depends also what kind of the language and the technology itself is. It's a scripting language and you really don't have binary executable out of it. So, you know, it's much more easier to write, to read in line what the comments are. So you don't want to put anything sensitive in the comments. Mm. And even the business logic or something that will give you an IP you know, competitive advantage, you don't want to put that as commented code. Um, and then if it's an executable that gets generated, the miss, the common misconception is that because it's an executable, you know, you, you the, the inline comments are really stripped out. It actually is not stripped out unless you explicitly state and create the executable to remove symbolic information. Okay. So, you know, when you remove symbolic information, then at least some of those text stuff would actually be taken out. This is anyway good for optimized performance, Perform right size, but, right. but it has an ancillary security benefit. But I've, we've, we've been in situations where we've taken an executable and reversed it, seen everything that's there in the comment line, and no one knew exactly what the, the code base was doing. Mm -hmm. right. And also, with it's maybe uh, I, 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 I know how to program in assembly as well as C. I know some of you, a few other people, maybe some new, some newer programmers don't know how to do that. So that is also to your advantage. But you, you but. Um, there is the legitimate reason you have to know why. And if you don't know why, that now, if your boss is going to find out why is it taking you three weeks for something that should have taken an hour, that's time. Time is money, and that's an impact on yeah, customer. We had a telemetry program we did years ago when I was with NASA. And one of the weird things was this particular telemetry processor, the version of it, could not handle loops. Yeah. It sounds stupid. But it could not. So you have this block of 190 lines of code, each one checking, each block going through. And of course, you know, put a big comment, I am not stupid. I understand how to do loops. <laughs> That's what my friend who wrote had to write that part of it. She finally got the short stick and had to finish it. It was like, I'm not dumb. I know how to use a loop, but this will not work here. And, you know, that's a, maybe a trivial example, but it helps because years later you go, what on earth is this person? I, you know, that's, that's an excellent example. I'm going to dovetail on that because uh, Margaret Hamilton, she was a programmer that wrote the code for the Apollo moon landing. And they released the code, and you and you can look at some of the comments, and this is just temporary, don't fire me, or something like that. That ended up being permanent. But the reason why they, there was a reason why they had to do it. And imagine you're landing on the moon, and in the Apollo one, they were, very, they were critically low on fuel. Yeah. And Pretty you close. don't want somebody, you don't want to program, you, if you have to figure out a, a way, like for example the Apollo 13 incident, when you have an emergency situation, you want to know what you can do to fix it mm -hmm. or to work around it. 
So I'm, I'm a stickler for things like this. I really am. I, if I'm approving of your script, if I'm, if you have to go through me on your script and you're not telling me what your script does and why, you're not getting through. And I don't care because I may have to be the one that has to figure it out. Or if you're let, if you move on to another company, the guys replacing you may have to do it. Okay, it may seem dumb, but there are valid reasons for it. There's actually a very good article called How to Write Unmaintainable Code. <laughs> Yeah, and it's fantastic. How to write unmaintainable yeah. code and tablets over all the things that you see in the industry that is very common, but the challenges you face with like and commenting is one of the sections that we talk. And there's even there's even times where you may think, okay, I can use a syst I, I can use a system called pause it rather than running through a loop, but there are actually people who had to go through loops because the system call impacted the code in, in an improper way. So there's a lot of there's a lot of subtleties. There may be a reason, and my point here is that as the auditor, I have to know why you're doing it and for what reason. Or you may have done it, and it may be working perfectly for a year. And let's say a year later, somebody said, "Oh, we we purchased this new product. It'll solve. It'll do what you're doing right now. We don't need your account anymore." That might be a good reason, or you might look at it and say, "Well, it's not quite the same." You may have to impl you have to know these things. Because if you want to manage your system without knowledge, you're just taking a stab in the dark. Yeah. Okay. I would like to announce that I'm glad that this is a dying concept. Um, however, a lot of small companies, I, I've, I've run into a number of them, still think that using emails is good for change management. Now, that's why I put this up here. Now, Many, I'm sure Marcus's company doesn't, wouldn't consider doing that, but there are a lot of CEOs out there who unfortunately think emails are documented, they already exist on our system, and you, you can distribute it to whoever needs to approve it so it's good enough, never. I've actually had to audit companies that use emails for change management. Now this was before PCI mandated that it, it be removed but it still applies today. And I put this in here, and a lot of people think, okay, I'll tell my CEO the reason, and they give 20 security reasons. I, no, that won't work. My na number one reason for not using emails is because it's too time intensive. As an auditor, even the best email system for change management can take far, can take 10 times as long as going through a change management tool, like Redmine. I've used Redmine before, it's a nice tool, I recommend it if, if you're looking for an open source solution. Um, there's a thousand reasons why, and I actually, I actually, um, this was not too long ago. I actually came across something regarding a system account of of somebody who, okay, John was the person who made this change. Okay, is John spelled with an H or with just J O N, short for Jonathan? It's John J O H N. It turned out to be Jonathan. I'm not using the real name, but you see my point. Names can be misspelled. My oldest daughter's name is Caitlin. But we still come across where her name is spelled. Caitlin, Caitlin versus Caitlin. <laughs> <laughs> and if you have a lot of international employees, sometimes one misspelling can be a big problem. Just so you know, I've actually, my, my first name is Manoranjan, but uh, I've been called Maruana. <laughs> yeah, oh my way it's actually spelled uh, the J and, uh, yeah my proper my, my proper name is Lawrence but a lot of people they can't find Lawrence more and they think I'm Larry more that's just my nickname and you know that, that ends up in, in, with problems so using emails and I'll and I'll tell this CEO now, now, when we say email okay email is going to have the email address which has the name of that account mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. properly spelled so I how do you know the account is properly spelled well because uh, <clears throat> well, if you're sending it to a change control board, mm -hmm. you ought to have an instruction that has their contact information. Right. Okay. And what if you, okay, you can misspell the name, but let, let, let me give you an example. Let's say Vern was, was the, one of the approvers, okay? My name is on the distribution list. Now, what if Vern accidentally, just honest mistake, hit reply rather than reply all? I'm not going to get that information. Now, Vern moves on to another company. He just found a better job. Now, I have to audit it, so guess what I have to do? I have to get Vern's archive 
go through it and find out was this properly implemented. The problem with emails is even the best method, okay. they don't, it, email will not enforce requirements, will not enforce policy. Yeah. Okay? I've had it where it, 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 the wrong email got sent to me, I got with the wrong, there's another Larry Moore and Dell. And once in a while we get, we get our emails mixed up. Yes? What about, what about the paycheck? Yeah, I wish that was the case too. <laughs> I was just, I was also kind of pondering like Vern was about how email um, could could uh, go wrong. And, you know, if you're putting the records in the email as a typed record or a written record, I could see that's where the misspellings and all of the names. So if you search for that name through the email database and they spell and spell one letter on that name and you're searching for the proper name, then that's where you have disjunctions and Larry, Larry uh, yes. Uh, I was gonna say you could also get lost in the sequence so yeah. if you have a sequence where it has to go through a chain of people and then get reversed back you may lose timing on who's doing what yeah. approval at what time especially yeah. if there's emails do, can keep emails can keep a record of history but a chain good change management tool will give you a number it's a unique identifier that email if you approve 20 people and I ask okay what's John what did you do regarding John oh, wait a minute which John well, John Smith, all right, was the, what number was it? I don't know, I think it was around May 14th. Now you have to go through that. My whole point is that the reason why emails are because regulatory <coughs> bodies have found that they were too much of a problem and it's too much of a, it's too much of a hassle. One change, I had to go through one change management request for PCI, it took me four months. I had to get archives, then I, had, I found one archive, it went to the wrong person, then I had to get that person's archives and go through it. Wow. And not only that, my last name was spelled M-O-O-R-E. There are last names, M-O-O-R. Nelson, N-E-L-S-E-N versus N-E-L-S-O-N. There are slight derivatives in last and first names that can take it on a completely different tangent. A good change management tool will force you to use, okay, Larry Moore, okay, I know there's two of them, let me find out who. You cannot go ahead unless you get the right one, okay? And it just from just from the business perspective, t saving time. If you have a customer who say, okay, going back to my example, okay, who approved John's account? With a good change management tool, I can probably reply within one hour. Well, let me look through it. On an email, it could take a month. You want to tell an angry customer who's under a SOX investigation that you're still trying to find out who approved it? No. It's happened to me. Emails are rejected and, and a, lot of, a lot of CEOs, well, emails are documented so we can use them. Yeah, but there's more to change management than just being able to find something in an email. And we all know they can be forged. Okay? No matter what, no matter how big your change is. Yeah. <laughs> no matter how big your change management record is, I guarantee your email record is ten times the size. Oh yeah. Plus, I have to, you know, I have to get IT involved for archives and all sorts of things. So you got to be careful on something like this. Four months, crazy. Yeah. Now I, I want to rush through because I am falling a little behind. So best practice. I'm not going to cover too much about best practices, um, but I am going to focus a little bit about primary and backward password management in just a moment. Okay, VM best practices. Um, you, have a, you have a VM system, you keep a backup of it. Well, how often do you make backups? And now remember, PCI and other requirements tell you you have to use unique passwords, but that's for the active system. If you have to go into your archive, grab your, system, grab your VM system and apply it, you may have to focus on uh, applying the updated patches. You may, have, you may have an outdated password. So you have to make sure you keep current copies of what you're doing as far as your backups. Like for example, if I change my password from A to B, but I stored my VM environment under A, I may forget what that password was. So just remember, and you want a separation of duties concept for the hypervisor, you want a different manager so that the administrator does not have too much authority. I'm not gonna go too much into Active Directory because I am running a little bit behind, but um, Active Directory is pretty straightforward. Um, if you are going to audit Active Directories, you do need to follow up. And I always make sure that if there is a change management process, I always get an Active Directory expert in to approve it. Because he, that person, 
I'm, I'm going to miss Active Directory permissions. Sooner or later, I'm going to make that mistake. But I want an Active Directory expert to make sure that everything is correct. So if you're doing any type of privilege that counts in AD, make sure you have an AD expert who's part of the approval process. Again, I say reasonable empowerment. I don't want to add too much complexity, but I don't want to miss out on things either. And obviously, you want to isolate your legacy systems because, let's face it, a lot of companies still use Windows Server 2000 for whatever reason. Okay. Yeah. Uh, for your ex it's, for your it's Windows NT actually because it's new technology. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and for way, your, we are <laughs> at, we are at Microsoft, yeah. all right? So everybody <laughs> hold your peace. Yeah. Um, <laughs> there are some times where we've had a prohibited remote access of accounts for specific issues dealing with um, trusted platforms. So you've got to make sure you manage your system properly, you like the one-time passwords. Uh, Two-factor authentication, what's also important, if you require dual-factor authentication for physical access at that server, you should also consider dual-factor authentication for the logical server. You may fail your audit if you don't consider both. So make sure you consider dual-factor authentication across the board. Okay. So for local access, use a gateway where they have to force, they have to go in through one way and it's easy for you to manage. Don't make it multiple ways that they can get in. Lock, lock down your channels. DR and COOP, I mentioned DR and COOP before. You have the RTO, which is the recovery time objective, and the RPO, the recovery point objective. You've got to factor both of these in. The time objective is the time needed to get to a working state. The point objective is a point in your system where you are now working, if it's not 100% perfect. So you may not be able to apply change formal change management for an emergency recovery. Maybe you create one change management record, apply whatever you have to do, and then write a report on what happened. Because, if, like for example, if you're a merchant and it's Black Friday and your system goes down, minutes count. Or you may be, as, as Vern mentioned earlier, a hospital where seconds count. You don't want to be worrying about you know, nitpicking over little change management records. You've got to get that system up and running. Password backups. I love backups, but one of the problems is that you've got a number of issues. Hard drives fail. Laptops get lost or stolen. People are unavailable. If, you, if I go wherever I go, this laptop goes with me. And if you can't contact me, you can't, I can't tell you what the password is encrypted on key pass, okay? So what I often recommend is pay, are paper backups, but paper backups have another issue. And I'm gonna give you an actual example. What you see on the screen is, is from an issue that we had a while back. We had a recover, somebody left for another company, it was perfectly legitimate, and we had to access his, um, his you know, the, 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 the root password. Problem is he wrote it. And there are two people on this planet who have atrocious handwriting, doctors and IT people. <laughs> okay? And let's go back to Murphy's Law. The more important the, the password, the more the worse his handwriting will be. Let's face it. Look at the top character that you see. It was this is my writing, but I, I try to copy his handwriting as close as I could. We were trying to figure out what the what the root password was. We were we, we, try, we thought it was a C, was it a C, was it a lowercase L? We tried various combinations, and you know with trying to enter passwords, you couldn't make another mistake and not realize it. Now what we did is, fortunately we went through his desk and he had a lot of notes, and we noticed that every one, that he, every numerical digit one, okay, was written somewhat curved. We noticed that, it just, that's interesting. So we tried it, got it. The point I need to make is when you are stacking up your passwords, it's not enough just to write it down because my, high, my handwriting is naturally in, uh, in, in ciphered. Hmm. You can't read it. Sometimes even I can't read it, okay? And so it's what safe. we- yeah. It's safe, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, a okay, number of Siri. large companies have a grid system like this one. This was created with Excel. I'm welcome to give you my copy. It contains a cover page. I, I love this. Tool. It's just a simple solution that, that makes things a lot easier. What you do is you write down the, the character and you circle, was this a lowercase c or an uppercase c? Well, that'll tell you. What is this? Well, it's an uppercase O. 
This is a zero. This is a lowercase w. When you are recovering and time counts, you don't want to be figuring out, okay, because how many permutations do you think you have to go through to try to get the right password? This tells you right now. I've also noticed that a lot of large companies do this for their encryption keys. A grid system like this, I think, will save you a lot of time and a lot of headaches. Now, like I said before, a number of large companies already do this. I don't know about smaller companies, but there has not been one small company I've seen that, that implements something like this. But I highly recommend you implement something like this if you do, because it can save you a lot of time and a lot of headache. What's a non sealable bag? A non sealable bag is something you can buy. It's, it's available. Once you seal it, the like only that. way you can do it is by cutting it open. You cannot, it's not like a Ziploc bag okay. where you can open it and close it multiple times. You seal it once, <clears throat> you're forced to open it by ripping it, and it, and it, it seal, the, the interior is in a way where you can easily tell if it's good. Wouldn't you want it to be in an unsealable bag so you only get to it when you absolutely need it? Yes, but if you reseal it, you can use a non-resealable, you can use another non-resealable bag. So the idea is you want to have a awareness that that bag has been opened. Tamper. Yes. Tamper. Well, now, I've never had to do this. I've never had enough time. But if I have to test the password to make sure is it accurate, I can. The, the non resealable bag will have a section where you write down information. You can cut out that section, put it in the second non resealable bag with a note saying, I tested this password on this date and it's valid. You can separate this grid into multiple and put them in multiple safes. Okay, a lot of people do that with encryption keys. <coughs> Okay, the point is, if you break into one safe, integrity. Yeah. yeah. If you break into one safe, you still have to get in the second or third. So um, this has saved us our, our hides a number of times, not just with passwords, but with encryption keys. And Larry, is there anything else that you would recommend for uh, writing down like passwords? I mean, for safety measures besides this is uh, you know seal key pass, last pass, last yeah. pass. And I love those tools, but I don't. I trust. All, I trust technology only so far. Right. You know, you can put a paper paper password in a in a fireproof safe and feel re reasonably safe. Thank you. Okay. And this is this is just like I said, Excel, or if you want, I'll give you my copy. You can print as many of these as you want. You can have a forty-five character password, and you can still create this system just multiple pages. Doesn't matter how many pages you need. Okay, yeah, send that out. Okay, uh, password vacuum. I'm not going to focus on this because I do need to go into the more important area of, and I'm going to be running out of time soon. Okay, teach Christ. Now, you used this last week, last month in your presentation. Yes. I loved it so much I added it to mine because I thought it was so. So what had happened is you can see the creation of Adam by Michelangelo. What you see on on the right is God. The left is Adam or man in this case. And what God is saying in this is, I love you, I want to do what I can for you to inherit my kingdom. And man's response is, eh. <laughs> God is reaching out as far as he can. Man on the other hand, his, his wrist is limp, he's leading away, he doesn't really care. He doesn't have this interest. Wow. So God kind of, so man just. No, that's actually, that's how Michael Joe painted it, he intentionally painted it. Yeah with a drooping hand and yeah. resting on its uh, yeah. knee. He's not trying. <laughs> he just keeps back. Resting on its knee because to, de to, de yeah. to, to depict that he by himself is incapable. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. So God came up with another brilliant idea. I love that. Of, well, let me back up. Um, the barrier is sin. The barrier is sin. It's pushing man back. So God comes up with this idea. Jesus, now, if you notice in the Bible, there is no reference to bridges. There's references to gates. There's references to doors. In other words, he's focusing on barriers rather than bridges. Now, I'm going to answer that question, why, in a moment. But Jesus, in a sense, is a bridge to, between man and God. Believe in Jesus as the Messiah, and you will inherit the kingdom of God. So what does man do? <laughs> Backs up again. <laughs> okay? So let me give you some examples. Jesus said, make every effort to enter through the narrow door. I don't know where you come from, away from me, from your evildoers. Because remember, Jesus, people were saying to Jesus, hey, we knew you, we ate and drank in your, in your presence, but what God is saying here is that I don't know who you are. You may know of me, you don't know me. I, I know who Donald Trump is, but I don't know him personally. 
Whatever you think of Donald Trump, it's just you know who he is, okay? The first example here is, is re referencing as a, as a narrow door. In Revelation, it talks about the New Jerusalem being a, a city with gates and walls. Now that sounds odd. Why would God want to put a focus on heaven and, and Jerusalem and talk about doors? Isn't he the one, isn't God the one who wants to reach out to us and get us into his kingdom, bring us into his kingdom, okay? It talks about foundations. A foundation in construction is the cornerstone of the building. Knock out the foundation and the building will fall. This is where I think it bridges all together, pardon the pun, okay? Jesus said, I and myself am the gate for the sheep. Jesus is the way between earth and heaven. Jesus is the way to get in. And, okay, there are two groups that fall into that. There are two categories. There are those who are seriously interested in a relationship with God, and there are those who just want to destroy, they lie, they cheat. As Jesus says right here, the thief comes in with the sole intention of stealing and killing and destroying. And then on the second one, Jesus replied, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah. On this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Jesus doesn't talk about barriers and gates and walls because he wants it to make it sound like heaven is just some sort of private country club that you have to get in. He's talking about this to protect us against those who want to destroy us. He's, yes. And one thing, uh, with, you know, he's not talking about Peter in that case. He's talking about the truth that was revealed to Peter. Yes. Sometimes that's yes. a common thing. No, yeah, you, you're you right. Confused okay. With. Because Peter, Simon said, you're the son of the living God. He said, for this was not revealed to you. But he taught, why would he give him keys to a bridge? God is giving him keys because he wants, he is the way to God. And, and Peter, and as the other apostles, were the original messengers. In other words, Peter says, go that way to, to, to heaven. And that's through Jesus. Now, what is interesting that a lot of people say People often say, well, God is just this private country club type thing, okay? Well, think about it. Remember when Jesus was on the cross, the first criminal mocks Jesus. The second one does this. First, the second one mock, rebukes the first one, followed by he admits his sin, he admits his crime, then admits that Jesus was innocent, and then admitted it, Jesus' divinity. He said, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And, now, to die on a cross meant you committed a heinous crime. What did Jesus say? After all that, you will be with me in paradise. In other words, the way is, in a sense, easy. It's not God who's making it hard. It's us who just refuses to acknowledge it. So those who, who are seriously interested in, in, in a relationship with God, they think of selflessness, they think of humility, they think of somebody more important than themselves. But those who are wanting to destroy and hurt, harm and, and do anything else, they're only thinking of themselves. It all, you can always see that. Sooner or later, it's always about themselves. And you might say, okay, I love God, I'm done. But okay, I'll move on to the next thing. Okay, no. Because just like an attacker, they may say, I'm the CEO, give me, your pa give me the password. Well, that doesn't mean they're really the, the, the CEO. Okay, watch out that you are not deceived, for many will come in my name. They may say at the beginning, I am he, but sooner or later, as you see them in their actions, as their heart reveals who they really are. And Jesus replied, he will keep my word. If you use the 21st century vernacular, Jesus replied, if they, if they want to join my network, they will follow my policies. Seriously, you can apply the same thing. Just as you are the gatekeeper to what should be going on in your network, Jesus saying, I am the gatekeeper to heaven. Follow my, follow my Father's policies and you will get in. Okay? If you want to follow in that way. But if I all, here, I'm going to give you homework. I'm the first one to give you homework. Read James chapter 3. James chapter 3 focuses on two areas. Number one, he focuses on the tongue. The tongue can be used to praise God, but it can also be used to blaspheme. The second part of James is the wisdom. 
okay? Wise people are humble. They think of others and themselves. They listen and realize their mistakes. They realize that they're sinners, but also realize that they want to get a closer relationship with God. If you came, all of you came to me and said, Larry, you sin A, B, and C. If I wanted to be wise, I would say, let me think about that. And you know, you're probably right, because we are all sinners. We all help each other identify our sin and help ourselves get a closer relationship with God. So read James chapter 3. I'll, I'll, there, there will be a quiz on that next time. Okay. So to summarize, if you're going to be a, the gatekeeper of your company security, or if you want to follow the gatekeeper to heaven, there are many identical ways that you do. Okay. God's commandments are the frameworks. Bible is the policies. Standards are parables. Because standards help, the, the parables from Jesus help you understand what God wants from all of us to do. Let me give you an example. Remember the rich man and Lazarus? What happened when both of them died? Lazarus is up in heaven, the rich man is down in hell. The rich man still doesn't understand because he tells Abraham, hey, Abraham, send Lazarus to get some water for my tongue because I'm parched. He still didn't understand. He didn't treat Lazarus like a person. He's like, he's like a dog. Fetch my slippers, roll over and play dead, and sit while I read the paper. The rich man did not treat Lazarus as a person. He didn't give him food when he needed it, and in heaven, he didn't even give him the recognition as a human being. Love and action are the procedures. Thinking of others, selflessness, uh, appreciation of God in, in your heart as well as your tongue, and awareness. As we were talking before this, what, what did we do? We learned something new about, what was your thing, the apartment? Apartment life. Yeah, apartment life. That's something I, I never knew before. Bible and Bible study, sermons. I, I've learned, there, there have been questions on, 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 um, on the Bible that I didn't even know that a good homily just, wow, I never really thought of it that way. Okay? And some of the information I gave to you is from what I learned from other people. So think about it as, as an uh, ever-going, ongoing security awareness training to help you get into the narrow door. Okay, That's why God refers to himself. He's, Jesus is the system administrator to heaven to protect us from those who want to destroy us. Any questions? I had an observation, actually, while you were talking about permanent and temporal, temporary controls so. or... Yeah. Um, you mentioned about the many times we have access and then we are we leave that but we still retain access because of either some you know access creep or they haven't terminated you through proper procedures. And in our Christian life we live before knowing Christ and believing and accepting him as our Lord and Savior. We live a sinful life and you know um, we were basically vulnerable. We accept Christ, but still that remnant of that old self, you know, creeps in every now and then. And so we find ourselves, rather than having a permanent account, going back to that temporary access that we have and yeah. the pleasures of the world, as opposed to where we ought to be, uh, which is because there's no proper controls. And that control really is, uh, uh, to, is we need to allow the Holy Spirit to manage us. And when we don't, it's when we fall back into that temporary state. So. And that's why, that's one of the reasons I love James chapter 3, because I, I, I read that every so often as a reminder. I can think I'm praising God, but my tongue isn't. And I must remember to remain humble if I want to be wise. And I'm not the one defining wisdom. Okay. Thank you. And, and you mentioned Jesus is the sysadmin of our life, and I just written down, then allow him to do the job to secure yeah. our life. Right? If he's our sysadmin, then <coughs> let him do his job. All right. Thanks, Larry. I want to respect everyone's time, so appreciate the presentation. Thank you. Yeah. But, uh, we have this room for a little while, so if anyone wants to stick around, uh, there's definitely time for discussion and just questions and answers and all that type of stuff. And if you want a copy of this, I'll be happy to send it to you. <coughs> yeah, It'll be uh, posted on the uh, Hack Homers yeah. webpage. And, uh, okay. <laughs> so we'll be yeah. like. Is that a pun attack? <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it shall be done because I... I want that coin back. <laughs> finally, yeah, yeah. finally I've, uh, I'll hopefully have some time this, this uh, Christmas time to be able to put uh, all the past videos as well. I have one video I need to pick up from you. So. Yeah, it's on, it's on that iPad, okay. by the way. Right. Thanks. So, yeah.
And awesome. welcome, by the way. Yeah, yeah this guy was, was awesome. Hope we can exactly. scare you away. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Not at all. We'll be back. No, I'm sorry, awesome. I wasn't picking on sales. No. no, no, no. You can't all day long. I pick on that too. Certainly so. Uh, but yeah, it, you know, one of a couple of couple of interesting examples. Uh, there was a guy who who uh, had, had left a company, became Cisco uh, SE, and got a, got an email two years after he left about a problem, saying, "Hey, help!" And so he couldn't reach the person. Said, well, I'll try my VPN. It worked. I'll try root password on the box they needed help with. It worked. Oh my goodness. He, uh, yeah, he, he ripped them a, a couple of new ones for. Yeah. Uh, and and the, the reason, the reason why I put VM in is because if you if you copy the to a back if you back it up, and you change the password like PCI requires, they kept trying to use the new password and they didn't know what it was. Mm -hmm. That'll hurt you. Does PCI require a new change of password for when change of management, or is it is it like uh, every anything that touches cardholder data? If you're a sysadmin for the cardholder data, you have to change that password too. Okay, cool. And just a comment on uh, I love the the fact. So it's like God just wants a relationship with us so bad, right? Because uh, you know we talk about you can tell a person if they're a Christian or not because you know their tongue or their actions and stuff, and yet we're still sinners, right? Everyone in this room. Uh, and I think for me, uh, it's humbling to just remember, remind myself when I see a Christian or a brother or sister in faith who, uh, I mean, I for one fall all the time, and, and seeing them fall, uh, it's always good to encourage them, remind them in a loving way. Uh, you know, much of God, you know, it's God Pick them do up for after us. they fall. <clears throat> totally, totally. And it's, I, I have to remember at the end of the day, man, it's not me who is putting that judgment. You know, I, I have no control. You know, I guarantee you when I go to heaven, like, I'm like, oh, my, man, where's my good friend who's an awesome Christian? Oh, he's not in here? Yeah. I'm like, wait, I'm like, dude, this guy made it? Like, you kidding me? Like, there's no way. And it's just so cool to me because it's it's humbling and it's like, you know what? I don't know where people's lives are. There's only like, so much yeah. we will know. Yeah. But the more, it, it, it's like through social engineering, if you can look at, if you can identify a social engineer in action, sooner or later, he's going to violate something. He's going to stray just like a Christian. You could say, I love God, but if I don't follow his commandments, right. I really don't love God. Right. I'm just lying about it. Yeah. Two things. One, I was going to say, when you talked about uh, access creep, I almost think of that as like people who, uh, have have lived a, a really good life for a little while but then maybe they got into the monies and you can look at some of the really rich preachers uh tv evangelists and stuff like the 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 soul the yeah. seed. so so they go here trying to do a good thing initially with the start and then they fall off but they still have that access because they had control. But that criminal on the cross got in because he <coughs> yeah. acknowledged it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and, and the other one was, uh, you know, I, uh, I definitely wasn't always a good person, father or, or husband or anything like that, but yeah, there's a point that, in time. You're implying that you are now? Or? No. <laughs> <laughs> Just I try. I try better. Good try. I try better. Um, sometimes it's very trying. But very trying. But, uh, you know, and then I joined a group, and it was, the idea wasn't, you know, hey, let's all try and be here, but it's, a, a group of, of guys trying to help each other become better men, or a group of Christians trying to help each other become better Christians. What's so interesting is some people who say, I, love, I, with. I don't have to go to church, or I don't have to do it because I know God loves me, <coughs> and I'm with it. I'm fine. Treat, treat, treat your wife the same way. So I, I know I love my wife. I don't have to take her to dinner, or I don't have to spend time with her. Sooner yeah, or later, I will live badly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 That will live badly. Yeah. So a lot of people, you know, one person actually told me, I, I, don't, try have, to I don't have to go to church because I don't <laughs> love God. So, well, wait a minute. How do you know? And I suggested the very same thing. Don't go with your girlfriend. Just say, I love you. I don't have to spend any more time because I know you love me. Mm -hmm. And he's like, I'm not doing that. So point. Point me. Mm -hmm. Yep. Well, and the pro doing the loving other people because yeah. that's if you say you love God but you hate your brothers who you can see. How can you have to? That's actually, you know, and that, that, that that's a challenge. It's like saying to hey, I love your brother, but your wife is ugly. <laughs> <laughs> that's what it comes down to, right? Like the bride of Christ is the believer, yeah. the brother, and saying that we love Christ and not go along with the, the bride of Christ is just a. Yeah, I'm yeah, more and more yeah. convinced that the fellowship time we spend with other Christians is a key element of worship. That's what God established. It's yeah. not even if you not so much. To, yes, it's to praise Him, but it's more for our benefit. So we have other people to communicate with and share with, and recognize. You know, we're flawed. Every, you know, every every church, if you, if you use the term or meeting I walk into, 
We're all a bunch of flawed people. Right. Well, I love the, the saying, uh, the church is a hospital for the broken, not a museum yep. for, uh, you know, the people, the successors. And uh, one other thing, too, we said we talked about the prodigal son, right? And they're like, oh, the prodigal son, you know, he, there's two kids, you know, one who did and obeyed God, right, or his father, uh, and was on, on track, and the one who just went off to party. Well, and when God says, when he's talking about the, uh, the prodigal son, it's not just the one that went off to party that was far away from God. It was the one who kept all his commandments because he didn't want God as a relationship. He wanted God for his power. He Jesus, God Jesus said there will be more rejoicing in heaven for one sinner who repents than 99 who have no need to repent. And he's not saying that the 99 are not saved. It's just that he's happy they are, but when you have somebody who's lost and now came back, when there's parting in heaven. Oh, you know, yeah, this is time to rejoice. Right? Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Cool. So I want to share a really cool parallel that um, I, I recently had come across as far as uh, the gospel and Jesus. So, um, as I was talking about at the beginning, the, the gospel, if you, if you search, you know, the gospel in your Bible, you'll come across 1 Corinthians 15, talk about Jesus died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day according to scriptures. So, like, that's the gospel. Uh, Romans 1 16, the gospel is power of God unto salvation. So that's, biblically, if you according to Paul, that's the gospel. But, um, you know, when we read what what do people do when they respond to the gospel, like in Acts, the very first time uh, that people spoke after the Holy Spirit was given to the believers, the apostles at Pentecost, for at, at that celebration of uh, the early church, he, he told, uh, Peter stood up and told about the death and resurrection of Christ uh, to, to the Jews that were listening there, to the Jewish people of the day. And at the end, they were like, well, what shall we do? You know, and he, and he said the response to repent, like Larry said, and to uh, be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. It's a promise. And he says, for all those that God will call. So just like, check out this parallel. So the gospel saves. The Bible says everyone who calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. Uh, and then the response uh, that Peter said, how, how should they respond? Uh, Jesus died for our sins, and, and then he says to repent in response. Uh, Repent meaning die to sin. So you, you decide, hey, I don't want to lie, steal. I don't want to do those things, God, anymore. I'm sorry. So you die to sin yourself. That first initial time of, you know, first time you repent towards God. And then uh, he says to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for forgiveness of your sins. Uh, well, the gospel says that Jesus was buried. So just like that, we likewise uh, are buried in the waters of baptism. Uh, you know, as a, as a witness to Jesus as being Lord in, in faith that Jesus is, is died for our sins. And then it says that on the third day, Jesus rose from the dead according to the Scriptures. And that's the promise of the Holy Spirit in parallel for us, and you will receive the Holy Spirit. It's the same Spirit that rose Jesus from the dead, gives life, gave life to the Lord, um, and it gives life to believers and people that call upon the name of the Lord too. So just a beautiful parallel to me of uh, the Gospel, which saves when we believe it, and our response, uh, which kind of maps directly into the, the three things. So I just thought that was really cool. Yeah, we're talking about change and repentance. Do you guys have Twitter accounts? Mm -hmm. Totally. So yeah, if you follow Hackformers, I've been tweeting out through it. Do you have a, a Twitter account? Because I couldn't find your hand. Do I have one. to? <laughs> okay, all right. So I couldn't find so, I'll, I'll I saw somebody... I'm, I'm going to kicking and screaming into the 21st and, century. Okay. And, no, the reason I'm saying is I've been saying tweet out there on yeah, repentance. So somebody else will get it. So. <laughs> Yeah, so, yeah. And also, one last thing about the Periscope. Um, so, the YouTube video won't be up until later, but the Periscope is, I don't know if you've ever seen it, it's just live streaming video. You just, you can install an app By on the way, I put device. Periscope on that. You can yeah, use that too. I've got lessons learned from that. Um, mm -hmm. For the next time, I think we'll, we'll do it from here too. But make sure you make a cop record though. So, Periscope, I oh, don't yeah, want okay. to rely on just the periscope recording. We want to have a, another copy. Yeah. 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 So, but the Can you periscope. The same device? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you could. Have. The the periscope is available for 24 hours after the first broadcast, then it goes away. So, um, anybody you thought that would you'd want to see this, or you just want to check a part still, of it or whatever. I can still see the old. Oh, did they change their policy to where so it's still so that's there? What I was going to ask you if you knew how long they maintain it. It used to be 24 hours. Okay, so I can still see the past presentations. And okay, stuff. Yeah, that's fine. And, 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 so, and, so and for the both of you that just them. joined us and still want to hang around us, yeah, okay. um, <laughs> any one of us just like talking shop, so I mean, we've got happy hours, not this month.